Okay, in that case, let's move on to drop out. I think it's the next topic that I ask you to investigate on your own. Any questions about dropouts? I just want to um, make sure of one concept for the dropout. Um, is it true that at each time of the forwarding, the which nodes to be randomly dropped is reinitialized? Is that correct? Uh, I couldn't understand your question fully. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I, ju I just want to better understand the the ensemble part. How do we achieve that? Um, exactly at what at what time when the the uh, re resampling of the dropout happened? Okay, so that's good. I give you a data point. That's an image. You are gonna push it through your neural network. As soon as you take that and you push it through your neural network, some random numbers are going to get generated. So per each example, you are going to generate some random numbers from Bernoulli distribution. Basically, you're going to flip a bunch of coins with probability P. You keep your neuron with probability 1 minus P. You drop the neuron. So that example is going to see a random architecture. So that's one particular instance of that architecture, the next training data that goes in is going to see another architecture. Maybe this guy is killed, this guy is active, this guy is active, this guy is killed, something like that. So each time a data point goes in, it's going to see a different architecture. It's going to go through some random architecture. This is good during training because you don't want to overfit. So this is going to prevent your overfitting. That's the first point. It's sort of acting as a regularizer. You don't want to memorize your data and you don't want each node of your architecture to be dependent or co-adapted to its neighborhoods or neighbor neurons. So this is a neuron. You don't want it to depend on the neuron next to it all the time. So that's why sometimes that neuron is absent. So everything is going to be random. A data goes in, a random architecture is going to get generated and your data is going to go through a random architecture. Now you have two options. In the end, you want to give your neural network and put it into production. You want to first test it and put it into production. When you are putting a neural network in production, you don't want things to be random, each time giving you a different probability. For instance, if you take that goldfish, push it through a neural network that's random, it is perhaps going to give you random probabilities in the end. You want to get a single probability out and be consistent. All the time, if I take the same image, push it through your neural network, it should give me the same number, the same probability. It should say it's a goldfish. How, how can you achieve that? You can take your goldfish image, push it through maybe 1,000 of these neural networks during testing, and then average the prediction in a Monte Carlo fashion. And that is exactly this blue curve here. That's exactly what you're doing. You take your image, push it through multiple random instantiations of your architecture, average your predictions out, and that's going to be your test accuracy or test error. It's going down, and then at some point it's converging. But what is the cost of that? You need to generate 120 architectures at random, push your image through 120 architectures, and then report the results, average the results. And this is going to end up being really slow. Evaluating a neural network once is okay, twice is fine, but 120 times, you're evaluating a network this deep and that wide, it's going to be super costly. Is there a better way of doing it, doing the ensembling? And the answer is yes. Let's look at this weight here, this particular arrow. With probability P, this weight is going to be present during training. With probability 1 minus P, it's going to be absent. It means that, let's say P is one half, half of the times it is present, half of the times it is absent. What you can do during testing is you can keep all of your weights. Don't remove anything, but compensate for the fact that half of the times this weight might be absent by downweighting it by your probability. That's exactly what you're doing here. Half of the times your weight could be absent, therefore use half of your weight. Your weight should be half as strong or it is half as important as it should be. Now your neural network is gonna have a lot of weights and biases. 
nothing is going to be absent, nothing is going to be dropped out, your weights are just downweighted by P. That's how you approximately combine many architectures. And that's this red line here. And they're giving you the same performance. This one is much cheaper. It's just one evaluation of your neural network. Does that answer your question? Yes, it really makes sense now. Thank you. Yeah, sure. There is another question. Can we apply dropout to all the layers? Of course. Again, the choice of where you want to apply dropout is a choice that you make. And any choice that you make is a hyperparameter. Should we put dropout on the convolutions? You can in principle, but people don't do it because convolutions are already regularized and they have sparse connections. Your weights, that idea of weight sharing is making our convolutions parameter efficient and therefore they are not gonna overfit. But something like uh, a fully connected network, it's gonna have a lot of parameters and that one needs regularization, something like dropouts. And we just saw an example. It was going from dimension 21,632 to dimension uh, 22,048. And the number of parameters in that weight matrix is huge. It's going to be something like this. It's going to be like this. So you're going to kill most of your parameters when you do drop out and therefore regularize it. Any other questions? Would there be any improvement in the performance in a relatively smaller network as well uh, with with the dropout? With smaller networks, when you say smaller networks, uh, you need to compare it to the size of your data. Maybe a network as giant as, uh, I don't know, something like GPT type of models these days is not big enough given compared to the size of your model. So everything is going to be relative. But dropout is typically very useful when your model has a lot of capacity compared to the size of your data it has this nature to overfit, then dropout is gonna be really helpful. I think uh, we are right on time. It, what I'm gonna do is give you the assignment that you should watch the rest of the videos up until slide 11 and come back to the class with at least one good question so that we can discuss them. And then I will take over from training very deep networks, highway networks. I think now is a good time if somebody wants to leave you can leave. For those of you who still have questions and want to stay and ask, I'll be around. Okay, any other questions?